dog. I never thought this screen would be something I would see in my lifetime. Kingdom Hearts 3 has been something I waited for for 2005 is when Kingdom Hearts 2 came out, bro. We're in 2019. Kingdom Hearts 3 is coming, guys, and... Ah! Oh, um... <laughs> I've waited 10 years for this game. This is so much bigger than just another game. Just a hype game. This is... I've put so much of my life into this game, so much of my heart into this game. You can tell you're really involved with the story when it's really emotional. Oh my god, I was in big deal. Oh my god, I was in big Throughout the previous decade, there were few video games more highly anticipated and built up in the mind than Kingdom Hearts 3. For 13 years, this conclusion to such a long-running story was merely a legend we speculated around campfires. Since 2006, when the first trailer for the game was released, the expectations and possibilities grew in people's minds. How epic will this finale be? How will every story element beautifully tie together? Will it surpass the beloved, artistically put together Kingdom Hearts 2? Fanatics everywhere made their predictions on when the game would release. 2015, perhaps? Nope. 2017? Sadly not. 2018? Yes! <laughs> but actually, no. And it's coming out this year. It is coming out in 2018. <laughs> in January 2019, after four games, three HD releases, a two-hour tech demo, and one piece of shit, the unthinkable finally occurred. Kingdom Hearts 3 graced the world and divided the fan base more than I could ever describe. Kingdom Hearts 3 is the biggest letdown of this entire series. I loved Kingdom Hearts 3. My first playthrough was an absolute dream. I don't know if I can play Kingdom Hearts again, bro. I can't overstate how much I enjoyed the finale to Kingdom Hearts 3. The fires from both the lovers and naysayers could not be contained. Arguments were repeatedly and endlessly fired at the opposition, creating a deafening amount of noise. Kingdom Hearts 3 was disappointing. No, it wasn't. You just raised your expectations too high. Hey, is it me or were the bosses pretty boring and forgettable? Oh, well, I'm sorry not every game can be exactly like Kingdom Hearts 2. Kingdom Hearts 3 bad, Kingdom Hearts 3 good, Kingdom Hearts 3 bad, Kingdom Hearts 3 good, Kingdom Hearts 3 bad, Kingdom Hearts 3 bad, Kingdom Hearts 3 good, Kingdom Hearts 3 bad, Kingdom Hearts 3 good. Everybody just shut up and stop hating all the time! By now, it's been years since Kingdom Hearts 3's initial release. My current save file is bordering on 200 hours. I've replayed the game multiple times. I found every lucky emblem without taking to Google. I've thought about it, and thought about it, and thought about it. And finally, I can bring you my opinion. The only opinion that matters. Kingdom Hearts 3 is a fantastic game. With an awful finale. This video will not be analysing Kingdom Hearts 3 as a whole. This is me giving a cosmically lengthy takedown of a conclusion to a saga that left me feeling hollow, unsatisfied, and bitter. I'm not going to sugarcoat a single detail from start to finish. Every single moment that makes up this game's lacklustre final act, no matter how insignificant it may seem, will be addressed here and now. A little ambitious, wouldn't you say? But there's a reason this video extends as far as it does. So if you're even mildly puzzled as to why anyone would dislike the story of this game, or you just want to have your opinion validated, my friend, make yourself comfortable. Because we have a lot to wade through. Alright, roll that transition slide, baby! <laughs> Before I showcase each and every issue I have with this bordering on four hours finale, it's important that I catch you up to speed and recap the events that take up the initial 20 hours of story. Worry not, we'll try and keep this short and painless. Emphasis on try. The rumbling in my tumbling. Where did Tara's body go? Power of waking! Okay, I'm exaggerating. There is at least 1% more than nothing that occurs throughout Kingdom Hearts 3's story. 
Maybe 2%. 3% tops. But let me be clear when I say this game has unquestionably the worst pacing out of any series entry by far. We open up with Sora journeying to Olympus in his quest to grow stronger once again. Because it's a new Kingdom Hearts game and reverting to level 1 needs to be explained every single time for some reason. Sora's goal here is to learn from Hercules how to grow super duper strong again. To which Hercules responds by bestowing us the eternal knowledge of... Yeah, I don't know. You'll work it out. Instead of gaining an answer, Sora decides he can work out how to grow stronger by himself. Especially if he finds something to fight for with all his heart. I'll find my strength the way you found yours. Something to fight for with all my heart. Well, sorry to break it to all you lot. Apparently you aren't a great enough cause for Sora to consider you worth fighting for. Hope you don't take that personally. Well, golly, wasn't that useful. You know, between this and the mishappenings of Dream Drop Distance, I'm beginning to wonder why we're taking advice on what to do from this pulsing wart. From here onwards, that plot point of Sora regaining his strength serves no narrative purpose, nor does it resolve itself in any form. Supposedly, Sora growing more powerful will lead to him learning the extremely vague power of waking. But these two plot threads do not coexist inside. Ultimately, it's a feeble excuse to have nothing occur in the story for an especially long time. And better yet, this is not the only plot point to lead absolutely buggering nowhere. Hey now, that ain't no way to say hello, especially to your old friends. This is the first appearance of Maleficent and Pete in the game and it may as well be the last. Their purpose here amounts to teasing a later story in a future title involving that god-forsaken wanking box. I'm gonna get into why everything surrounding this box is bad, stupid, stupid and bad, but until then, I have to wonder how it's possible that these two managed to contribute even less to the story than in DDD. <gasps> you big <f> <laughs> Works for me! Do you remember back in Kingdom Hearts 2? When an endless horde of Heartless were closing in on the protagonists, only for Maleficent and Pete to spring to the defense, diving head first into battle for the greater good. I bring that up because that scene did wonders for both characters, and since then they've just moseyed around teasing a purpose but never actually having one. From then on, we bounce from Disney World to Disney World where nothing of note happens during or in between. An organization member appears, spouts a whole lot of nothing, fucks off, rinse and repeat. Oh, the game certainly pretends relevant story is happening, but it isn't. For example, there's a running plot thread that if one of the Guardians of Light drops dead, the organization can use another light as a backup. But guess what? So wasn't that a worthwhile necessary plot point? Similarly, once we get to the fan favorite Frozen World, Dearest Darling Lark scene teases a plot thread involving the brand new Princesses of Heart. Why do we need new Princesses of Heart? What was wrong with the old bunch? I think Tetsu Inamura was asking the same question as he wrote the script, but never came up with an answer. And then we get to World's End and once again the fabled mysterious box. Luxor jumps back into the charade in search of the box, and if you've seen the third parts of the Caribbean movie, you can work out how this will go. They hear about a box, they believe it may be what they're searching for. Surprise! It contains Davy Jones's heart. Guess that was all for naught. One might say, all for Xehanort. The only reason any organization member shows up in a Disney world is so they can say, hello, I exist, look forward to fighting me at the end. Cheerio. Narratively, their cameos serve extremely little point. And before anyone says, but didn't Kingdom Hearts 2 do the same thing? No. For one thing, organization members appeared in Disney World significantly less often in order to make their appearances more noteworthy. But more importantly, for the most part, their arrivals served a purpose. The initial interaction with Demex is a clever method of manipulating the player into thinking that this guy is a pushover. Run, run away! And in the end, he wasn't. 
Sora confusing Zigbar for Riku is a strong piece of emotional foreshadowing. These moments felt important and contributed to the pacing of the story. Also, you actually got to battle them earlier on, something this game really could have benefited from. This time around, there are only two interactions with an organization member in a Disney world that hold a fecal stain of value. The first features a possessed Riku who monologues about the success of the replica program. More on that later. And the other is with Vanitas because, well, you know, don't you? <laughs> But otherwise, there is nothing going on in the Disney portion of the game that matters. And that isn't to say I don't enjoy playing through the Disney worlds. On the contrary, every single one of them is extremely fun to journey through except this one, and sometimes the tales taking place in these worlds do vaguely tie into the overarching story and the cast of characters as well. But do they prevent the player from getting frustrated over how little important story has occurred throughout 20 hours? Speaking personally, they do not. But Harry, that isn't fair. What about all the story cutscenes that occur in between each Disney world? Are you just going to ignore them altogether to fuel your narrative? Well, first of all, how the fuck do you know my name? And second of all, I'm glad you brought that up, because this is where the 1% of story I mentioned earlier takes place. From the beginning of the game, there's an ongoing side story in which Riku and Mickey dive into the realm of darkness to rescue Aqua. They then dive back out of it because I guess being trapped in the abyss for eternity only applies to women or something. You sexist turd of a hellscape. I'll talk more about this story piece later on, but if you've played the game, I reckon you can guess what I'll be bitching about when the time comes. Although while we're here... You know that moment when Mickey compared Aqua to Sora, causing Riku to wah and fans to giggle? I think fans were so amused by that moment that they forgot about the insanity of the dialogue centered around it. What if she's feeling as scared and alone as I felt the first time I came here? How long are we supposed to keep her waiting in this awful place? But Aqua, she's like Sora. What? No, 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 no. Strong like Sora. Oh. Okay. Good. Then I guess she's going to be all right. Aqua is strong. Therefore, there's no harm in leaving her lost in purgatory for a little longer. My god. Behind that smile is an evil philosophy. Let's see, what other plot threads do we have? Oh yes, yeah, Sora tries to work out how to revive Roxas. All that does is mildly set up the replica storyline and barely matters. Organization members spy on Sora, that doesn't matter either. Kyrie and Lee are training in a forest with the belief that once they're done, they'll be more than ready to destroy Xehanort in the blink of an eye. <laughs> <laughs> and as for the remaining cutscenes, they usually amount to teasing a future story that has zero bearing on the current one. For example, we have this scene where Xemnas reveals to the audience that Demex, Luxord, Marluxia, and Luxine have an ancient Keyblade legacy that slumbers within them. And if the thought of these guys carrying keyblades doesn't make you want to melt into the ground, we will never see eye to eye. The only thing I can call story relevant that actually has value to it is the 13 darknesses slowly revealing themselves over the course of the game, which the trailers did very little to hide. Although, I will give credit to what they do with Vexen. His story is he's returned to the organization because he prioritizes research over anything else, and Organization 13 is where he feels he can garner the strongest results. That's an interesting idea that actually feels in character. I'm into that. Let's see where it goes. When I heard Xehanort had gone looking for you, I realized it was my chance to find you as well. For you see, I too wish to atone. <laughs> Fuck off, no you don't. You, 
Vexen, the smirking, overdramatic totter who acted like he was born to be evil. Man, they didn't even try to make his arc seem convincing, did they? Evil bastard good boy now. Watch out, Zuko. There's a new contender for best character arc on the horizon. Oh yeah, Ansem's back, by the way. I forgot to bring that up, because his presence feels significantly less noteworthy than I was expecting after the foreshadowing that Da 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 left us with. So I digitized myself and my research, and hid them within Sora. So this is... Data? Yes. A clue, I hope. Jeez, Namora had no idea what that data was referring to at the time, did he? But I guess that counts as important story, so there you are. That would be the 2% of total plot I was talking about. But for those of you who aren't very skilled in numbers, 98% is significantly larger than 2%, and that 98% is still depressingly meaningless. In fact, we have to wonder what Master Xehanort is up to while all this pointless meandering is going on. Is he just chilling on a mountain, practicing his finger? wiggles for 20 hours or so? Apparently not concerned about the time travel time limit established in the previous game. What would he have done if Sora never saved Aqua? Everything seems to be hinging on her being restored, so if she wound up dying in the realm of darkness, would he just turn to his fellow noughts and be like, well that's a bummer, at least we tried boys, good job, pat yourselves on the back, we'll get him next time. Keyblade. I know some people don't like the pacing of Kingdom Hearts 2, but at least there was a narrative reason for Xemnas waiting in his castle doing nothing. But in the case of Kingdom Hearts 3, the villains really are just waiting for the plot to happen. Maybe Xehanort is more relatable than I realised. But with that, I've covered all I have to say about the first 20 hours of Kingdom Hearts 3 story. Let's summarise where everyone is right now. Riku's in the realm of darkness again, visiting his new best friend, the Devil's Tower. Ansem's free, Aqua isn't, Vexen's a good boy now, as is the rest of Ansem's apprentice crew. And everyone else still needs a save-in. Alright, let's do this. Time for the part of the video you came for. Strap in, folks. Here's why Kingdom Hearts 3's finale was a beautiful masterpiece where everything came together in a wonderfully satisfying conclusion, except it wasn't, haha, ha, fooled you. It begins with Sora finally being able to buzz off to the realm of darkness and save Aqua. How does he do so? Why, with the power of seven words. Seven very, very annoying words. May my heart be our guiding key. Alright, this is gonna sound obnoxiously nitpicky, and it kind of is. But it's important that we understand why this bootleg Star Wars slogan feels entirely forced and unnatural. And to do so, I'm going to compare it to one of the most iconic lines of the series. I've become part of their heart just as they've become a part of mine. And if they think of me now and then, if they don't forget me, then our hearts will be one. I don't need a weapon. My friends are my power! On the surface, these two lines appear to be built with the same purpose. They're both needlessly serious mumbo-jumbo that primarily serves to motivate the main character. But here's the difference. My friends are my power carries weight and doesn't detract from the writing. Friendship is the encompassing theme of the series. Every vital aspect of the characters and their stories relates to friendship in at least some manner. And this rings true for Sora more than any other. So when he grandiosely delivers that line in Kingdom Hearts 1 and again in Da Da Da, the audience feels the power in what is ultimately a cheesy moment. Especially in the latter. I'm proud to be a small part of something bigger. The people it did choose. <gasps> my friends, they are my power! Now here are the issues with the other line. Kingdom Hearts has a history of adding in elements, pretending they've always been a part of the franchise, but rarely is it as on the nose as this. May your heart be your guiding key. Huh? What's that? Master Yen said always said that. Goofy, according to Kingdom Hearts 2, you and Donald didn't even know where Yen Sid lived. Master Yen Sid lives here? <laughs>
In addition to how shoehorned in the line is, the game tries so painstakingly hard to convince you that it's deep and meaningful and matters oh so much to the franchise. And it doesn't. In fact, do you want to know what the line actually means? Well, here you go. Hey, the script says I need to go here now, so I guess I'll go do that. Huzzah! A portal appeared! It's a vehicle to get Sora to wherever the story wants him to be at that point. Nothing more, nothing less. When it comes to moving the plot forward, this solution is so extraordinarily cheap that Sora must have paid an American healthcare bill at some point, and it was all he could afford. Alright, that's more than enough rambling about eight measly syllables. What happens next, you ask, even though you already know? Because why else would you be watching this analysis? The gang bounces over to Destiny Island, and every single player universally echoes the same statement. Let us explore Destiny Islands, you fucking swollen verrucas. But we don't. We spend two minutes in a Destiny Islands cutscene and then it's never seen again. And it's at this point that I realized Square Enix doesn't understand what Kingdom Hearts fans desire. When you ask a die-hard Kingdom Hearts fan what their favourite world is, most of them probably won't answer with a Disney world. They'll more likely answer Twilight Town, or Travis Town, or Radiant Garden, or the world that never was. Yet, considering how small or non-existent the playability of these worlds are here, Square Enix evidently disagrees. In the years leading up to Kingdom Hearts 3's release, there was constant speculation over where the final battle would take place place. Of course we knew we'd fight in the Keyblade graveyard, but that doesn't mean the final battle would occur there. The most popular suggestion was naturally Kingdom Hearts itself, but I distinctly remember plenty of yearning for a conclusion set on Destiny Islands. And rightfully so, that would be a perfect thematical location for the story's denouement. And better yet, we wouldn't have to buy the DLC and access the data greeting mode, just so we can run around a minuscule amount of the tossing location in a pitiful attempt to fulfil what we longed for. I'm not saying Destiny Islands should have closed this saga, but it would have offered more emotional resonance than a barely established, entirely unexplorable worm. <laughs> Let's try and stay focused. So we fast forward through some dialogue and it's time to once again play as Riku, fighting against the most critically acclaimed boss fight of all time for the 78th round. And then towards the end of the battle, a command appears. The command is named Sora. And this command summarizes half of the issues with this final act. Sora is a spotlight stealer. Almost every contribution throughout this game's story is committed by Sora. Sora bursts in to save Aqua. Sora is the only playable character throughout every final boss fight from here on apart from this one. And he's the only character who gets the amount of screen time he deserves. Now the average person might say that of course the main character will be the one to save the day. What did I expect? I didn't expect Riku and Mickey to serve no purpose in their mission throughout the story. This ongoing plot thread in which both characters repeatedly try to rescue Aqua is devoid of value because Golden Boy Sora managed to get the job done without learning anything new. And in all honesty, Riku as a whole just isn't very engaging in this game. None of the crushing snark and one-liners from previous entries is present here. And because his character arc finished with da da da, he isn't given a struggle that compels the player. And just so we're clear, Riku is my favourite character in this series and the subject of many teenage very heterosexual fantasies. I want to adore him every second he's on screen, but he's not given the material to make that a reality. Also, he has a new Keyblade. Why does he have a new Keyblade? Why can Heartless snap a Keyblade in half? Does anyone prefer this to Way to the Dawn? Why does Keyblade lore get further fucked in the throat with every new Kingdom Hearts game? Shifting away from Riku, let's talk about the shameless tease that is... Anti-Aqua. We had to retroactively change her title because everyone logically believed this was Aqua after getting naughted. It even became a meme for a while. Aqua got naughty! 
Ryan. If you were around for the build-up to Kingdom Hearts 3's release, you know how big of a deal this was. Aqua has grey hair and golden eyes? This can only mean she was possessed by Xehanort! What will this mean for our protagonists? How will this affect the course of the story? Well, we needn't worry, because the Aqua issue is solved in a few Keyblade Wax and that's all, folks. If Aqua hadn't been taken over by darkness, Sora could have just waltzed in there, flown her out, and the story wouldn't have changed one bit. Hurrah. I wouldn't have so much of an issue with this if it wasn't for the emphasis the trailers placed on her. You don't conclude your trailer by threatening a popular character if the threat doesn't matter. In fact, the biggest takeaway from Kingdom Hearts 3 is that Square Enix doesn't know when to fucking quit with its trailers. Hey, remember that time when Square released a video called Kingdom Hearts 3 Final Battle Trailer? Final bloody battle trailer? Imagine if in 2006 a trailer for Kingdom Hearts 2 came out that was just a highlight reel of characters dying as well as the boss rush against Xemnas. What a sensible idea that would be. Anyway, where were we? Oh yeah. One pretty great fight against Aqualator, and Sora and Riku conjure a rainbow keyblade with a palpu fruit on the end of it. Hmm. Somehow, this frees Aqua from possession and bibbidi bobbidi boo she's back on Destiny Islands. When did they fall to darkness? You're in the realm of light. <sighs> this reunion cutscene is perfectly fine. Nothing sticks out as particularly daft. It doesn't feel painfully half assed This moment's okay. You get a pass from me here, Kingdom Hearts 3. Although, then again, the fact that my strongest feelings towards this long-awaited resolution can be summarized as, eh, it's okay, is rather telling, isn't it? And spoiler warning, this won't be the only cutscene where my highest honour of praise is that it's simply alright. Most of the plot resolutions throughout Kingdom Hearts 3 don't go beyond the most basic and bare bones of expectations. Did you want to see Aqua get saved? Well, you're in luck, because Aqua got saved, and that's all there is to it. Did you want to see Roxas, Lee, and Gion reunite? Well, you must have swallowed a four-leafed clover, because as it so happens, they reunite. And that's basically all we see of them. I'm getting ahead of myself. What happens next, Kingdom Hearts 3 cutscene video? Oh yeah, Vexen is still trying to convince the audience that all he wants is forgiveness for his misdeeds. Every time a former villain in this game babbles on about atonement, I roll my eyes so far into the back of my skull that if I'm not careful, I might just get stuck staring at my brain. In the pursuit of science, we sometimes make terrible mistakes. Lose sight of our mission to help people. Oh yeah, we've all been down that road. One day you're helping an old lady across the street. The next day, you're performing inhumane experimentation in a dodgy science lab. Understandable, Vexen. Here's your golden sticker of redemption. Why would you pick me? I cannot let the Chosen catch wind of this, understand? Oh, I see. It's because I got benched. I got benched too! What? Hey, <laughs> quiet! Okay, I will admit, the dynamic between both Vexen and Demix here is pretty entertaining. I'm not entirely satisfied with Demix's PS4 character model, mostly because the hair colour suffered a bit of a downgrade in my opinion. In fact, I have the same issue with Luxord and Larxene as well. But regardless, the dialogue and movements exchanged here are a riot. And any grievances I may have with this cutscene as a whole are immediately repented for, thanks to this magical phrase. Yes! <sighs> Demix time! I don't know if that was a deliberate reference. I don't know if anyone watching this video knows what that could be a reference to. And if you're unaware of what I'm talking about... I'm not going to explain it to you. After that, we transition to a cutscene involving Ienzo, Demix, Ansem, and the broken kidney stone of a replica subplot. If you don't mind, or if you do mind, can't say I care either way, it's about time we dive into the plot thread surrounding the replica vessels, and why it doesn't work. Since 2011, when recoded grey star screens and was blessed with the overwhelming reaction of When the journal got all digitized, we found the old entries, right? 
So, we've known that pretty much every dead character is going to make a comeback so we can have our lovely, neat, little, devoid of consequence ending. Now, whether or not you like this story decision is a whole other can of dusk that I could honestly dedicate an entire video to. But regardless of my thoughts, we've always known how this saga is going to end. Then came DDD and Data Ansem. God, can there be one character in this series who doesn't have a Data counterpart? Stated that he placed mysterious Data inside Sora and that will somehow lead to bringing the whole gang back to life. How very exciting. Well, as it turns out, Ansem's crew can just create as many replica bodies as they want and everyone can return with relative ease. Except for Repliku. He's not allowed to exist, apparently. I guess having a heroic, overdramatic conclusion suits him more. Whatever. Anyway, the reason why the concept of bringing everyone back via replica vessels isn't a good plot thread is very simple. It's cheap. There is zero creativity behind simply saying, Oh, we have an endless supply of mannequins that you can live in now. Woohoo! If that was always a plausible solution, that might have been worth mentioning at any point in Kingdom Hearts 2. You know, the game that hammers it home how doomed nobodies are to cease existing. Oh, and also, can we talk about this line here? Uh, Demix, is huh? that you? How many other skinny cloak wearing mullet sporters are you familiar with? Man, a decade in the organization together and Zexion barely even knew Demix existed. Also, I don't really want to talk about this, but I have to. It's time to address Ansem's apprentices and their, <laughs> redemptions. A lot of people like these fellas, particularly Enzo. And to those people, I have to ask, have you read the secret Ansem reports from Kingdom Hearts 2 recently? You know, the ones where we learn they repeatedly performed incredibly dangerous experiments on innocent human beings, followed by casting their teacher into the realm of nothingness forever and ever. Forgive my pettiness, but these readings don't exactly paint them as redeemable. And this is of course not taking into account absolutely everything they're responsible for throughout the entirety of their decade in the organization. But Harry, they didn't have hearts and they were manipulated, so that clears them of all guilt. Yeah, about that. Can we take a moment to allow Xemnas to remind ourselves about how the whole not having hearts fallacy works? A heart is never lost for good. One can banish the heart from the body, but the body will try to replace it the first chance it gets. For as many times as it takes, even after we were divided into heartless and nobodies, it was just a temporary separation. Now, given the fact that most of the organization was a part of the squad for a decade, I'm pretty confident in saying their hearts should have grown back by the time we see them, especially given how much they clearly enjoy being evil. But hey, it's all good, because Ienzo said they were deceived. Everything he and the rest of the Apprentice crew willingly took part in for so long be water under one shockingly large bridge. Venus and Xehanort have no hold over us now. We're just students of the heart. I can't stand this scene for a moment. Just once, I'd like Sora to question how flimsy the explanations behind the bad guys not being that bad are. For at least a second. Just because Kingdom Hearts is a series centered around friendship doesn't mean every interaction with a former villain has to go, Sora, it's me, former bad guy. <gasps> Gasp! But you are a bad guy. But I'm not anymore. Oh, okay. You got a friend in me. But you know what? When Radiant Garden was descending into feces, Ienzo was but a child. Doesn't excuse everything he did in the organization, but the fact that he was no older than at most 11 maybe justifies him somewhat. That sure as hell can't be said for the rest of the crew though. Alias, whatever's between you and Roxas, it's in the past. <laughs> At this point in the video, I can already hear the refutes people will have. Why are you taking Kingdom Hearts so seriously? You're not supposed to think about it this much. It's just a fun, silly series. Hey, remember when Goofy got hit by a rock? Ha 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 ha. And yeah, I'm not going to pretend that every game before 3 was an immaculate showcase of world building and logic, but I've never had to suspend my disbelief as strongly as this game wants me to. And we're not even up to the finest example of Nomura san demanding I just go along with it with tears in his eyes. All right, that's enough whining out of me. How much more have we got to go through? Two hours and 40 minutes! Jeez, I fear for how much editing I'm going to be presenting myself with. Okay, 
Wasting no more time, our protagonists make way to Castle Oblivion, ready to restore it back to its original state and rescue a comatose Ventus. Much like the previous cutscene with Aqua, I don't take much issue with the next 10 minutes of story, but I can't help but feel this is happening too fast. Couldn't there have been just one additional cutscene with Aqua where they talk about, well, absolutely anything? What the last 10 years have been like? Some reminiscence on when she met them in BBS? How much of a wank stain Mickey is? Just anything before immediately going through the motions of what fans have been expecting. Could someone tell the writing department there's a bit more to storytelling than just filling out a checklist? Give characters time to breathe. Just for a moment. I can't stress enough how much it would help the flow of the tale being told here. Okay, how about I say something positive for the first time in history? This transformation sequence is fucking gorgeous. It would have been extraordinarily easy for there to just be a flash of a bright light and the land of departures back to normal. But nope, they went the whole hog in showcasing its reconstruction piece by piece. I may be a whiny little miscarriage, but I give credit where credit's due and it absolutely is here. And we finally get to explore an original non-Disney world in Kingdom Hearts 3! And it's over in about seven seconds. Why do you detest me so much, Namora? But either way, after years of anticipation, we finally reach the chair in which Ven resides. I'm sorry it took so long. Jokes aside, this moment's cute. I've never been as big a fan of Aqua as a lot of fans seem to be, mostly because when it comes to liking characters, I prefer an engaging personality rather than large breasts. <laughs> But 0.2 did soften me on her character quite a lot, and as a result, I enjoy this cutscene well enough. For once, you won't find me complaining. But the sweetness of the moment can't last, for it's time for the entrance of the most overly edgy, cross-dressing tosser the series will ever introduce, Venetus. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt your touching reunion. You know, I do admire this guy, trying to appear cool and badass when this happened a few hours prior. Anyway, Mr. Vanny Boy has come to stop the gang from restoring his brother. And the fact that he's suddenly referring to Ventus as a sibling must have made a lot of shippers uncomfortable. But anyway, Sora gets ready for combat, and let's take a moment to observe how pathetic the main hero's reaction time has become. How many teleporting bad guys have you dealt with in the past, Sora? If it took you this long to simply turn 180 degrees, then it's no wonder your entire crew fucking dies later on. But you know what? My nitpicks don't matter, because now it's time for Aqua to take the spotlight. Keyblades in hand, the scene centers around her, and every fan feels a grin spread across their face as Aqua shows Sora how it's done and takes Vanitas down for the count. <laughs> Seriously? <gasps> if only this was the last time our blue-haired role model gives a disappointing performance. Sorry, but you've seen me too weak, too often. But fear not, my friends. In a moment of pure worry, Sora desperately yells Aqua's name and in doing so, feels his heart connect with Ventus, finally restoring him. This sequence goes on for two minutes. Yes, apparently they still saved her in time. Very considerate of Vanitas to perform the mannequin challenge three years late. So evidently outnumbered, Vanitas buggers off for the finale and Sora and Ventus are finally introduced to each other in the flesh and blood. And this moment feels bizarrely casual and lighthearted. I get that keeping the atmosphere calm and less bombastic was probably the point, but it feels a little jarring. A child just woke up from 10 years of being comatose and Sora's first response is, Hey Ventus! At the very least, I would have imagined there'd be some backing music. But apparently that wasn't the vision. Good morning, Ven. Good morning, Aqua. I like that line. Simplistic, but it's a good line. It's also the one single line I remember from Ventus in the entire game. And that might not be true for you watching this, 
But I don't imagine I'll be alone here. Good morning, Ben. Here we are, back in Yen Sid's tower, and can someone explain to me how Sora keeps bouncing from area to area? How did him and Aqua even locate Castle Oblivion in the first place? They only found it last time after falling into a world of chaos and nothingness. Anyway, the gang begins playing catch up with each other, filling in everyone on what's occurred in the story. And it's at this point that we gain the most unintentionally hilarious exchange of dialogue in the fucking game. Did you know Riku's a true Keyblade Master? now? That's wonderful. Good for you. you fucking shit. This had to be a translation error, right? That can't possibly be how the line was intended to come across. Just so we're clear, good for you is a thing you say when you have no idea what to respond with but want to remain positive. So what I'm gathering from this moment is Ak was still bitter over Mickey not dashing in to save her sooner. That's it, that's canon now, you can't deny it. Also, why, pray tell, is this cutscene so stagnant? We're experiencing the next generation of Kingdom Hearts graphics, and yet everyone continues to stand extremely still, occasionally making the odd hand movement. There's nothing dynamic here at all, and again, I know I'm being nitpicky, but I said I was going to address everything, and this just feels bizarre. Especially when the game has repeatedly shown us what it's capable of. Not to mention, some of the gaps between dialogue exchanges are so drawn out that I'm left extremely perplexed. Trust me. I'm not giving up. Kyrie's right! Alright, time for a positive moment or two. I like that Sora doesn't remember his interaction with Aqua as a child. That feels like an accurate, befitting moment for him. I also greatly appreciate Aqua and Kyrie picking up where they left off over a decade ago. Especially as it's practically the only long-awaited character interaction we actually wound up getting. Oh, and also, of course I have to mention Lee becoming the Deadpool of the Kingdom Hearts series. Ven looks just like Roxas. Or is it Roxas looks just like Ven? Apparently everybody already knows everyone, and this is an insane amount to get memorized! I'm conflicted about these lines of dialogue. On one hand, yeah, it's funny to see Lee repeat the frustrations of newcomers to the Kingdom Hearts fanbase. On the other hand, I'm worried that he'll become too much of a fourth wall breaker as time goes on. This isn't the only time in the game where he practically face fondles the fourth wall, and if it keeps up, he'll be relegated to a comic relief character, rather than one of the most interesting showcases of development in the series. Not to worry, folks. To help us out, I've given each of you a gummy phone. They've got summaries of everything that's happened so far. Fuck this line, fuck this line, fuck this fucking line to the darkest depths of solitary confinement. That way, you can read up, if you'd like. And if anyone has any questions, we can call each other. I cannot believe it's canon that the Guardians of Light catch up with the Kingdom Hearts storyline off screen. That is a real moment that actually happened. I can't imagine a finer example of this game's pacing being unbelievably rushed. So after that, we cut to Ventus and Aqua gazing at the gorgeous sky of the mysterious tower. Man, I sure wish this area was playable, like it was in the trailers. Yeah, most of you forgot this was shown to us. I wish I forgot as well. Anyway, I don't have much to say about this scene. It's perfectly passable, not much for me to whine about. Although it is weird how little Aqua has to say throughout it. The stars here are so beautiful. I noticed it when we arrived. Yes? We've gone without this for so long. I know. Let's share stories when Terra's back. Yeah. When you talk to people, do you find they do this a lot? Uh-huh, yeah, fine, uh-huh, yeah, mm. Well, I... It's because they're not listening. When your friends see you, essentially they're doing you a favor. Don't worry though, because I have an absolute warehouse of polarizing shite to say about the following scene. Shouldn't you say goodbye to your real home? <sighs> Why? I 
I don't expect a lot of my opinions to be universally accepted. When it comes to this game, there's no such thing as a universally agreed opinion. But I think this is my most divisive take in this entire novel of a video. My friends, let's talk about the quarter-baked, quarter-arsed redemption of one Isa. 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 Baby! To garner an understanding of why I hate what they did to this fella so much, I have to break down a full timeline of Isa's character. Birth by Sleep is where we see him at his youngest, and as far as the game tells us, he's a pretty average bloke. A bit snarky, a bit reserved, pretty harmless overall. Towards the ending of the game, we're given the implication that he and Lee have tried to break into Ansem's castle on at least one occasion. Now, my personal interpretation was that Lee and Isa were eventually captured and experimented on, turning themselves into nobodies. This idea is further supported by Lee wearing his organization coat when he wakes up in Dream Drop Distance. So Isa becomes a nobody for a decade as Syx. We fast forward 10 years and he's the most demonic, unlikable bastard you could ever dream to encounter. Oh, you're just exaggerating, Harry. Shut up. No, I isn't. Every single one of the 358 days this game takes place over, Syx says or does something to ruin the days of the Sea Salt Trio. Y'all remember the time he ordered Roxas to place a device in Agrabah that would play a part in ending the life of his bestie? I sure as hell do. And yes, I know that he had a falling out with Axel. And yes, I know he believed himself to have no heart. I don't give a shit. It doesn't justify 1% of his bastardness, nor will it ever. And if you still think I'm playing it up, please replay the game. And no, don't settle for the 1.5 movie. Never settle for the 1.5 movie. That thing doesn't do anyone the justice the OG product does. So come Kingdom Hearts 2, and he's basically the same. Extremely manipulative, blatantly adores being evil, everything you'd expect from a villain. Not much more to add, so that brings us towards Dream Drop Distance. You could argue this game was the first real step towards a proper heartfelt redemption for this boy. I don't know why you would, given he has 8 seconds of screen time, but people do. Because he made an expression that you can interpret in any manner you want. Point is, we don't know anything about how his character feels by this stage. He could be feeling differently to how he was in Kingdom Hearts 2, and he could also not be. And that brings us to now, where Syx is a double agent who suddenly wants to join the good side. And everyone accepts him because that's what the script says. Nowhere in Syx's character is there a clear arc. He was this way in one game, and now he's this way in the other game. Ultimately, the problem with Isa, God, I don't know which name to call him, someone help me, is the exact same problem that plagues the entirety of this finale. Not enough time is given to make any character progression satisfying. Doubly so when a brand new character is shoehorned into their respective arcs completely out of nowhere. I hate this plot point. Kingdom Hearts is hardly a stranger to introducing new story elements out of nowhere, but never has it been this unsubtle. There is no effort to hide the fact this conveniently unnamed, undescribed girl didn't exist before this game, and was clumsily inserted to make Sykes appear sympathetic, and I find it nothing short of aggravating. Many folks have theorized she's one of the characters in the mobile gacha game, but to me, she may as well be Daisy fucking Duck. In fact, I'd welcome that more, because she didn't originate from a game that I absolutely refuse to care about. So that's why I don't like Isa. And it's not like I'm opposed to the idea of a redemption story for him, but what we got was a mere tease for a redemption that wasn't given the time it required. It's like the game presented me with a freshly cooked burger, and as soon as I closed my eyes and leaned in to inhale its scent, it unzipped its trousers and urinated up my nose. Well, fool me once, sir, but I shan't be fooled a second time. From now on, any time you try to piss up my nose, I'll be far away not paying you an atom of attention. If you're still keeping up with this analogy, you have my respect. Anyway, I think I've said my piece on this scene. What comes next? Oh, oh, I've been excited to talk about this one, ladies and gentlemen. Let's talk about the immensely anticipated sharing of Paupu fruit between Sora and Kairi. 
I'll be real with you all. I have never cared about the romance of these two. To me, they're nothing more than a run-of-the-mill, underdeveloped love story that exists because Sora's the main character and he's obligated to have one. However, let's imagine for a moment that I was a Sokai shipper. Let's imagine that I've been eagerly waiting for years and years on end to see this couple finally partake in the event, teased since 2002. If I were that person, I think I'd be pretty upset with how it wound up being written. Who would have guessed this segment, endlessly demanded by fans, would begin with Sora's complete befuddled confusion? Here! What? Huh? And it's only made funnier by what happens just a few seconds prior. Sora asking why Riku's all alone. Wow. I want to be a part of your life no matter what. That's all. Okay, Kairi is clearly not looking in Sora's direction here. Forget sharing her life with him. There must be a fascinating seagull that she wants to declare her wedding vows with instead. Also, I thought they were going to share one Poo fruit together, not have two between them. Was sharing the same piece of food too explicit for Disney? Alright, let's put the jokes aside for a moment. If you, the person watching this, are someone who genuinely feels passionately about these two as a couple, I want you to let me know if you liked this scene or not. I'm genuinely curious because to me, none of this landed in the slightest. To me, it felt like Nomura only wrote this moment because he knew that's what a lot of fans wanted, not because he cared himself. Which is even more evident considering the scene is somehow less romantic with the Japanese dialogue. Oh, and by the way, I have to address one line in particular. <clears throat> Let me keep you safe. There. Consider it addressed. Also, Riku and his replica share a moment. But I'm not done yet. Got one last thing to see through. Let's talk about that later. Oh, thank the fucking heavens, we're finally at the Keyblade Graveyard! And it only took 7,269 words of my essay to get us here! And the YouTube video only has two cocking hours to go through, my god, save me! <clears throat> so, after all this time, our heroes finally enter the fated land, the Keyblade Graveyard. The gang's in full serious mode, giving dramatic nod after dramatic nod. When out of the blue, the head honcho of the Nort fam rears his smooth skull. When the darkness falls, will we be found worthy of the precious light the legend speaks of? Or will all of creation be instead returned to the shadows? I love the fact that Xehanort's Heartless teleports in to continue Master Xehanort's sentence, as if they repeatedly rehearsed this moment. Alright, listen up, Heartless me. When I ask the question in regards to finding the precious light, that's when you pop to the right and deliver your line. Okay, but when you say the right, do you mean your right or their right? My right, of course, idiot! But how far apart do you want us to be? I I'd hate to risk stepping on your tippy toes. Look, we'll head on down to the location later and draw some X's for us to stand on, alright? But won't that look bizarre? Can you quit your whining for one bastarding second? Uh, excuse me, Xehanort pal, but can I not teleport right next to the young version of you? Oh, and why not? Well, uh, we're not exactly equal in height. I'm gonna look pretty pathetic by comparison. Oh, is little evil Sora feeling a bit insecure? Tough cum. At least your voice hasn't had a noticeable drop in quality. So after the Xehanorts take the Drama Queen trophy, we begin to hear a very familiar piece of music. <laughs> okay gang, get ready! <laughs> Ever since Kingdom Hearts 3 was announced, it was inevitable there would be at least one fight similar in scale to the Thousand Heartless battle from Kingdom Hearts 2. I mean, the game just wouldn't feel right without it. The Thousand Heartless battle is perhaps the most blatant contender for the highlight of the entire series. 
Kids. It's an unforgettable segment that had every child and also grown adult bouncing up and down in their chairs from uncontainable excitement. So naturally, when this battle was implied in the trailer, fans were overwhelmed with anticipation of which they could once again barely contain. And now the game has been out for a few years, it feels like not one person ever cares to talk about it. It's as if it barely left any impression at all. Alright, let's dive into why this battle doesn't have the slightest piece of emotional impact. Now let's be fair here. There are people who felt underwhelmed by the original epic Heartless Slaughter. All you gotta do is mash one button to wipe out the same two enemies over and over. It's not complex, it's not particularly challenging, it's as basic as combat can get. And you know what? That's an entirely valid critique to offer. But here's the thing. The Thousand Heartless battle isn't amazing because of the actual battle. It's amazing because of the phenomenal build-up towards it. Do you remember how it felt when the grounds of Hollow Bastion began to shake? Do you remember the chills you felt as you watched the family of Final Fantasy characters that you'd formed a connection with dive headfirst into battle? Do you remember how you felt watching Cloud and Leon shit-talk each other back to back? Do you remember how it felt to get thrust into one of the most fantastic battles of the series against one of the most unexpectedly awesome characters? Do you remember how it felt watching Mickey Mouse somehow transform into the most badass character of all time and no I'm not being sarcastic? How fucking dare you assume that? Do you remember how it felt to battle alongside every single one of your Final Fantasy buddies? But most importantly... Do you remember that moment when things seemed calm and quiet? And then all of a sudden the music fires up into action more than ever before. An army of Heartless surround them from every corner. Move it. And just before the battle begins... Sora, Donald, and Goofy share the grandest of looks I could ever dream of seeing. It might be cheesy, but it makes me giddy just thinking about it. Now, how did Kingdom Hearts 3 handle this again? Oh yeah, they appear out of nowhere and then they're gone forever. 10 out of 10, Square Enix, amazing job. I suppose you could say the fight is more strategic, since you aren't just hammering one button now. And that might be agreeable if I could tell what the fuck was going on throughout the entire sequence. Not only are half the enemies inaccessible, but it seems the portal they materialized through might have stolen a few animation frames. Also, gauging your progress with a bar instead of an enemy counter just isn't as satisfying. When you have a specific number of enemies to kill, you have a clear understanding of how far you're powering through the segment. Whereas here, it's more down to estimation. And finally, if you're going to have a serious, legendary battle, concluding it with Sora riding on a train while the music switches to hand in hand is one hell of a tonal shift to end it on. Man, just imagine what could have been accomplished if those designers didn't spend so much time on attraction rides that grew dull after a single usage. But hey, I can't be too hard on this sequence. Not when it preludes one of the most embarrassing cutscenes in Kingdom Hearts history. Before you even face the Thirteen, every last one of you will be torn heart from body. But fear not. The Keyblade will still be forged. We're not gonna lose to you. We stand together. <laughs> Normally, I have to thoroughly explain why I take issue with a certain story decision, but this time the problem is as blatant as it is simple. Terranaut and a lot of Shadow Heartless. So, you know how I mentioned before about how Maleficent and Pete took on a seemingly endless barrage of Shadow Heartless by themselves? I guess it's a miracle they ever survived, considering there is no force more formidable than the Kingdom Hearts equivalent of a lot of Goombas. I get what Namora was going for. I understand he wanted to raise the tension by showcasing no one was safe. But if turning every single character into an unreactionary dipshit is the only way to do it, then why even bother? 
And of course, this scene, much like every other scene in this game, has its defenders. For example, there is the belief that Aqua now has PTSD due to her decade in hell, and to be fair, there are elements of that being a likelihood. But if they wanted to showcase her being severely traumatized, they should have dedicated more time to that personality aspect outside of a few battle quotes. But either way, that still doesn't excuse her from standing perfectly still, daydreaming about God knows what, while her bestie gets sliced through the chest. I'm gonna be honest here. When Sora decided the best plan of action for protecting Kairi was to give her a cuddle, I was rooting for Terranaut. If you're dumb enough to go for a hug in a situation like this, you deserve to be sliced in half. And again, I get what Nomura was intending. But if you have to make your character's brain dead for the moment to occur, any emotional impact is ruined forever. But above all else, what I truly hate about this scene is it ruined any concept of power scaling. Ever since Kingdom Hearts 2, there have been online debates about how powerful each character is. Is Roxas one of the strongest organization members? Is Sora still more powerful than Riku? Is Zemna stronger than Sora and Riku individually? You could have these debates for hours on end. But now who cares? Terranaut, the guy Aqua bested by herself, can just wipe out the entire squad without much effort. But hey, at least we have this corker of a moment. No! Donald, no! So it's not all bad. But anyway, after everyone gets gobbled up, we have a quick cut to the most bizarre, pretentious game of chess ever concocted, followed by Sora waking up in the afterlife. Sort of. My heart and body perished? Something is holding you here, refusing to let you go. All right. The next several minutes of story is extraordinarily difficult to follow even by Nomura standards, so you'll have to bear with me for a moment. To my understanding, if you reach the final world by death, you shouldn't have your body intact. But because Sora's the protagonist and has a lot of friends who love him a whole bunch, he is able to return so long as he stops crying and pulls himself together. 111 times, that is. But before we tackle that minigame, how about we address the mysterious stars of which you can examine? Each star carries a paragraph of cryptic backstory for fans to dissect. Now, I'm not a theorist, so I shan't be discussing these pieces of text, but there is one particular star that warrants my attention. Sora? Yes? It's me, Naminé. So Sora reunites with Naminé's heart, and we learn that Kairi is using her strength to keep Sora alive. Whatever that means. The conversation then shifts to Naminé herself, as she feels very upset over Roxas being a more popular character than her. <laughs> Man, if Naminé has feelings of inadequacy due to fan reception, just imagine how Kairi feels. And finally, Naminé reveals that she's been shifting through memories and doing so has led her to Terra's lingering will. By tracing a connection with him, she can bring him to the Keyblade Graveyard, where he will help alter the events that previously took place. No, I don't understand it either, but just go with it, please. So now we have an explanation for how the Lingering Will appears later on. I realize a lot of players were confused by this sequence, primarily because this entire cutscene with Naminé is optional. A later patch made it mandatory, but when the game first released, you could very easily walk straight past it and therefore have no understanding of this entire event. In fact, this story thread is double optional, because Naminé and Terra communicating initially began in a moment that was exclusive content in a fucking Kingdom Hearts concert. Yes, really. 
Why couldn't I have been a die-hard fan of a different video game franchise instead? And I'm not even gonna bother talking about Chirithi, because I'm pretty sure it's related to the Mobile Gacha game, and I don't want to talk about the Mobile Gacha game. Oh, and also, can we appreciate that the background music here is a remix of the fucking Dream Eater minigame theme from DDD? The name's Chirithi. Truly, there is nothing better to represent having just experienced death. So after Sora has put himself back together, he's ready to rescue everyone else using the power of waking. Because if you say it enough times, it might start to actually mean something. May your heart be your guiding key. Shut up, bitches! From this point onwards, we take a page out of the end of the world from Kingdom Hearts 1 and have a quick compilation of every Disney world we've visited. And honestly, the entire final world segment of the game, alongside this montage of heart rescuing, is probably the best part of Kingdom Hearts 3's finale. I don't fully understand it, and not much story occurs, but it's got creative ideas, it tackles an interesting theme or two, and it even reminds us that Jiminy Cricket it hasn't suffocated from being inside Sora's hood for so long. Jiminy, you're okay. Well, okay might be a stretch, but what are we waiting for? We need to find the others. <sighs> right. That's a nice moment. I like it. Although it does leave me wondering what Sora's journey has been like from Jiminy's point of view. There's some food for thought. Eventually, Sora of course saves his buddies, though not without young Xehanort somehow being able to teleport into this weird dive to the heart and afterlife hybrid. Whatever, let's not question it. What do you think the power of waking is? I don't know, please fucking tell me already. I think that line was originally one of Nomura's script notes, but he never worked it out and just wrote it into this scene instead. Oh. How does your telephone continue to carry a reception signal after passing on to a reality outside of time, life, and consciousness? Anyway, it's now time for Sora to return to the Keyblade Graveyard. So after opening a portal, he finds himself reunited with Kairi. And it's here we learn that just her act of believing kept Sora from fading away. I told you, Sora. You're safe with me. I think I'll talk about this scene later. Because now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the most confusing moment in Kingdom Hearts history. Let's see if you can wrap your head around this, darling viewer. It's plainly presented in this cutscene that Sora and the gang remember what happened to them mere minutes ago. They are fully aware they previously tried to press forward and were met with the terrifying blockade known as Forced Conflict. And yet, a mere few seconds later, the cutscene starts playing out exactly as it did before, implying they don't remember what happened initially. Tara! Then! Tara, we found you! So, anyone got an explanation? Well, I spent some time mulling it over because I'm not going to use my time for anything productive, am I? And here's my attempt at a theory. It's been established throughout this series that some events are destined to happen. It doesn't matter what you do, you can't avoid what is foretold to occur. Why can't you? Good question. Anyway, if we're to assume this cutscene is predestined, maybe our heroes have no choice but to follow through these motions, and it's summoning Terra's lingering will that managed to break this prophecy. Did any of that make sense? Don't answer, of course it fucking didn't. But I don't have a better theory, so that's what we're going with. Did my beloved Nomura-san go out of his way to make this series of events as impossible to follow as he could? Why else would he write the script this way? Regardless, the cutscene plays as usual before Terranaut is unfortunately interrupted. In comes Lingering Will, stepping into the fray like a champ. Got you, Xehanort. For some reason, he can talk now, despite not being able to in Kingdom Hearts 2, but who cares? Despite having no body, this suit of armor is the only character, or human character anyway, who tries to fight back, so go on! Fuck that man up, homeboy! But the excitement doesn't end there, folks, because it's here we get yet another fight with the most critically beloved boss the series has ever known! 
What is it about this tosser that made Square Enix want to repeatedly shove him into the spotlight so badly? The Xehanort saga? No, 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 no. No, this is clearly the Demon Tower saga now, boys. In fact, this boss battle is so exciting that I didn't even notice how the lingering will disappears after his one moment with zero explanation. So after this fight is done, Sora finally manages to grow a spine and lunges headfirst into the Tornado of Shadows. And in doing so, he meets the last person he'd ever expect to encounter. I'm not going to talk about the mobile gacha game. I refuse to talk about the mobile gacha game. <laughs> I don't want to talk about the mobile gacha game. I don't want to talk about the mobile gacha game. I don't want to talk about the mobile gacha game. I don't want to. All right, let's get this over with. Kingdom Hearts Unchained X slash Union Cross is a game set hundreds of years before the franchise began, tackling the ancient Keyblade War. The characters are boring, the gameplay is dull, the story spans over a thousand pointless filler quests, character backstories are annoyingly altered, and I routinely pretend it doesn't exist. The game has its fans, of course, but if you enjoy the story of Unchained, either you're subscribed to Everglow, or you're similar to a busy hospital. Because you have tons of patience. <laughs> And unfortunately, despite the fact that the average player doesn't give a slither of diarrhea about this money-grubbing turd, Nomura decided to include its story and characters in Kingdom Hearts 3. So as a result, we have this cinematic in which as you hammer the triangle button, the names of thousands of actual players of the game appear on your screen, assisting you in taking down this enormous tornado once and for all. Okay, jokes aside, if you are a legitimate fan of Unchained Union Cross X, then maybe this segment was absolutely incredible for you. And if you feel that way, I genuinely understand. But that only applies to a small percentage of fans. When it comes to the rest of us, this sequence of events is a very pretty spectacle and nothing more. Sure, when you're in the moment it's pretty awesome, but the context of the cinematic being just a little bit shit prevents the scene from being up there with something like the laser dome from Kingdom Hearts 2. Also, if we're talking about the super duper not good gacha game, I suppose we may as well talk about the loathsome mysterious box. Do you want to know what the laziest idea for a plot thread is? having some sort of container, and then just not saying what's inside it. It's the most boring, uncreative method of getting people interested. Anyone could fucking do this. In fact, I'm gonna do it right now. Okay, hello, uh, we're going to draw a door. Uh, this shouldn't take too long, just gotta get the brush tool out, go to a different layer quickly, uh, make the brush a lot smaller. We're gonna draw a uh, straight line down here and then a second straight line. Won't look perfect, but that's okay, as long as you can tell it's a door. Uh, and then a third line here, of course, will uh, make a the brush a bit bigger, so we can make the door handle about here, I think should be good. A bit smaller we'll go for, actually. Uh, yeah, that'll do. And quickly we'll make a, uh, a square at the top, just so you can tell there's a window, make it more evident that it's a door. Uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, again, a bit rough around the edges, but you can tell ultimately that it's a door. So, yeah, that's that's my door. I hope you like it. What's inside the mysterious door? Tune in next video to find out! Subscribe! Alright, enough gacha garbage. Back to what this video is actually about. Are you okay? Yeah. <sighs> what was that? Keyblade wielders from long ago. It's the light of the past. I love how that's Nomura's idea of an explanation. How did these ancient weapons suddenly garner sentience? Light of the past, we clear, good, next scene. The dust once again clears itself and we're greeted with the possessed cross-dressing femboy version of Riku. He begins powering himself up, when all of a sudden, a ginormous silhouette of Master Xehanort apparates from above him. 
Well, let me tell you, I am very grateful Dark Riku didn't use that during his data battle. Could you even imagine? We gotta make sure you're not blundering your way toward a second failure. Wait, so the villains remember killing the Guardians of Light off as well? What the fuck even is this plot point? Whatever, let's just move on. Oh, more demon towers, hurrah. Do you think every morning Nomura looks in the mirror and smiles at himself for creating such an incredible boss? I'd believe it. Why are the Shadow Heartless still moving like that? When did the tutorial enemy suddenly become so impossibly difficult to render? Did someone at Square just spontaneously become nostalgic for the Atari 2600? If you try to use time magic against these numbers, you won't have enough strength for the final battle. Huh? Since when was this a thing? So after the gang spends entirely too long doing absolutely fuck all, they're interrupted by a nuclear bomb of light. And who could be responsible for it? Why, none other than Disney Dumbledore, of course. <laughs> I will hold them all here for as long as I can. I'm conflicted on this moment. On one hand, yeah, it's cool to see Yen Sid join the battle Smash Brothers style. But on the other hand, we're now left wondering where this git was every other time Sora was in serious danger. Also, for Yen Sid to save the day, everyone else had to look pathetic for a while. Which seems to be a running theme here, doesn't it? You got to run! Me and Donald will stay here. The two of us will back up Master Yensid. Donald. Goofy. You are all back by yourself, Sora. Don't worry, we'll catch up with you in just a bit. Mmm, <sighs> okay, fine, you got to me there. That was a good moment. Actually, if there's one thing this game did well in terms of character writing, the bond between Sora, Donald and Goofy was genuinely fantastic. Almost at the expense of Riku and Kairi, Sora's other best friends, but still, I appreciate that. Seizing the opportunity, the light squad dashes through the opening, and we cut to the unnerving silence of the Keyblade Graveyard. Slowly, they walk along the path when eventually we're met with all 13 Xehanorts, this time in a pyramid form. <laughs> I'm glad to see those rehearsals once again amounted to something. All right, boys, you know the drill. As I walk in, there will be six of you walking on either side, forming a perfect triangle. Uh, oh, not tired of whining yet, are we, boy? I'm just wondering why we're doing this in the first- Does pizzazz mean nothing to you? Where's your sense of fanfare, imbecile? But how are all of us going to walk at the exact same pace? It's not like we all have the same walking speed or leg size. Excuses, excuses. I should have naughted Yan Sid instead. His beard always knew how to comfort me. I didn't know where I was going with that joke. Could you tell? And yeah, I know I'm not a very good voice for Master Xehanort, but to be fair, neither is the actual guy they got to voice the bastard for this game either. I have waited patiently, but together we shall unlock the Keyblade Wars secrets. I don't know if it's miscasting or voice direction, but every line this fella spouts feels off. As if the actor had no idea what he was talking about, which is entirely understandable to be fair. I don't need the voice to be a carbon copy of Leonard Nimoy, rest in peace, but the difference here is far too jarring to ignore. But hey, a subpar voice is hardly the most annoying thing they did to Master Xehanort in this finale. But we'll get to that. So Xehanort, being the drama queen that he is, creates a series of battlefields for Sora to go through, so we can eventually face off against him in the grandest of clashings. Here we go. <laughs> what the hell was that? You know, let's just not question it and move on. All right, loyal viewers, pour yourself a drink, make some toast, and grab a piece of fruit because staying healthy is important. It's time to talk about the final boss rush. And man, do I have a lot to say about it. I'm the boss, I'm the boss. 
So, does anyone remember those hack videos from back in the day where people would duplicate a boss multiple times or add in characters that weren't supposed to be there? I used to binge those videos all day long. They were wonderful times to look back on, truly. And apparently someone at Square agrees with me, because they got nostalgic enough to implement them in Kingdom Hearts 3. It was an interesting decision to combine multiple bosses into one, and I don't have a problem with the idea and concept. But as you can most likely guess, I do take issue with the idea and execution. If you've been keeping up with my phenomenally large list of complaints, my reasoning for not liking the combined bosses segment of this game shouldn't be difficult to figure out. Everything that happens in this game's final act happens so quickly with such little breathing room that it's extremely tough to properly soak in and enjoy the story points as they happen. And these boss battles are yet another example of that. A huge number of long-awaited segments happen in such a cramped space of time that instead of feeling natural, it feels like the story is rapidly filling out a to-do list. Maybe in Nomura's mind, fighting 13 individual battles would take too long and grow tiring. But personally, if I'm experiencing an epic series finale, I want it to drag out as long as possible so I can appreciate everything that's thrown towards me. If Square really wanted to introduce a series of battles with multiple bosses at once, I think it should have been an option post-game section, similar to the Colosseum of Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2. Hey, remember the Colosseum battles, guys? I sure do. It's such a shame that on the way to their headquarters, every single Square Enix employee tripped over and landed headfirst on a very large rock, causing them to forget half the staples of numbered Kingdom Hearts titles. But that's enough lamenting on the story aspects of these boss fights. Now for the more important question. How are these battles from a gameplay standpoint? Well, they're fine, I guess. Nothing noticeably wrong with them. They play out pretty much as you'd expect, so that's cool, I suppose. All right, I'm just gonna come out and say it. This series hasn't been the same since reaction commands were ditched. <laughs> When these cinematic button prompts were introduced, Kingdom Hearts managed to showcase how genuinely epic it can be as a franchise. Before I got to Kingdom Hearts 2, I never would have imagined I'd experience something as hype-inducing as Sora parkouring off of skyscrapers being thrown at him, or the famous sequence that concluded the grandest boss the series will ever have. While the basic combat was already fantastic, it's these moments that took the series to an all-new high. And yeah, some people didn't like them, because they only required one button and made fights too easy at points. But instead of polishing the mechanics so they're even better for the next game, Square took them out altogether. And the consequences of that really show in Kingdom Hearts 3. None of these boss battles are bad from a technical standpoint, but there's no excitement, no flair, no cinematic to any of them. Sure, fighting Marluxia is pretty fun, but I want to throw his scythe back at him again, goddammit! And let's not forget, the reaction command was crucial for organization members and nobodies as a whole. Do you know how saddening it feels to fight Dusk Nobodies without being able to reverse around them? Heck, that's not half as sad as fighting snipers without being able to harness their lasers and repel it against them. Every Nobody had a unique reaction command that narratively tied into their respective organization member. And without them, the fights just become significantly less special. I'm trying to have an open mind to differing opinions as I go through this video. But if you're someone who is happy these fights no longer have the cinematic and narrative spectacle that Reaction Command's brought to the table, yeah, I'm never going to understand that. All right, that's enough whining about the boss battles. But while we're here, I think I should address the Keyblade Graveyard as a whole. Serious question here. Is the Keyblade Graveyard anyone's favorite final world? Is there a single person who's ever said to themselves, oh, the end of the world made me want to put an end to my world. <laughs> and the world that never was, <laughs> more like the world that never was worth playing. <laughs> Thank you. But the Keyblade Graveyard, 
Now that place hits me in my sweet spot, baby. This place has been a final world in two Kingdom Hearts games, and on both occasions, it's tiny and visually unremarkable. I mean, there's just nothing to it. It's empty spaces and large rocks. Maybe if you're extremely enthusiastic about the lore of this world that I could understand why you'd love it. But it's hard for me to care about the lore considering most of it is told via a mobile gacha game where every character is a chibi sprite. Jesus Christ, I'm never gonna get to the end of this video. Okay, so after you slaughter each boss, you're greeted with a little farewell cutscene of sorts. Let's start with Possessed Riku, shall we? No. You beat Ansem and you're still here. This guy is me. Or Riku Replica, because this man is jealous of how many clones Sora gets to have and wants a few of his own. I knew it. It's a replica. Riku Replica. Replica. Riku Replica to the power of two. Why do I love this series again? So for some reason entirely out of nowhere, Mr. Nomura decided he wanted to romanticize Repliku as much as he possibly could. In this cutscene, he decides he's going to sacrifice himself to give Namine a body because he loves her just so much. Platonically, romantically, I don't know. But regardless, could I please remind the class that dearest Repliku was brainwashed to become unhealthily obsessed with Namine to the point of trying to commit murder? I can't be the only person who finds it a bit creepy that this dude getting mind raped is suddenly viewed with cinnamon roll goggles. Namora plainly disagrees with me because a few months after Kingdom Hearts 3 released, he doubled down and stated the connection between Namine and Repliku can be strongly felt. No. No, it can't. Namine doesn't mention Repliku even once after he's gone in Chain of Memories. She has no reason to feel anything towards him other than a desire to book him a therapy session. I don't see how you could possibly buy that for a moment. Oh, and also, why can't Repliku get his own vessel as well? The supply is seemingly infinite. He doesn't need to give up his own being at all. Anyone got a sound explanation? Feel free to pause the video and spend the rest of the year trying to form one. God knows you'll need it. And one final point. Considering the absurd number of characters and resolutions and revelations he's witnessing, Sora doesn't seem very confused, does he? No matter who he's talking to, he's apparently following perfectly fine with no no questions to ask. I suppose that's the benefit of catching up with all the lore and details off screen. So that scene didn't have an atom of sensibility to it. Now let's take a look at Zigbar's farewell scene. <sighs> Actually, I have a better idea. Let's not, because I have nothing to say. Between this and the post credit scene, they're blatantly setting up for him and the Fortellas to be involved in the next game somehow. But it's the Fortellas and they're boring. And the plot surrounding them is boring. So I don't care. Moving on. <laughs> Luxord, Marluxia and Larxene all have pretty similar goodbyes, in that all of a sudden they want us to sympathize with them. Even Marluxia, who coordinated the kidnapping of a child. That same child whom he was ready to use as a shield, so he could brainwash another child. Ah, but that's water under the bridge now. It must be one very tall bridge, let me tell ya. I don't have much to say about Luxord's goodbye. It's the same issue that I have with Marluxia's, albeit to a lesser extent, because Luxord was one of the lesser evil organization members. He still partook in many terrible tasks, but whatever. Farewell, Ansem's brother. Oh, come on, you can totally see it as well. Between the three goodbyes we see here, the one that gets under my skin the most belongs without a doubt to Luxord. Just watch what she says here. I was really just along for the ride. With... <sighs> My secret. Most of the Kingdom Hearts fanbase has taken these words as an implication that Larkseen is into Marluxia. Apparently there are some unchained cutscenes to back that theory up as well. <sighs> You know, the reason why Larkseen is such a fantastic character is because she's a relentless, soul-crushing sadist who couldn't care less about anyone around her. So the sheer concept of her willingly becoming a tool for Xehanort just so she can have a shot at Flower Boy's cock doesn't sit too well with me. Also, Larkseen and Marluxia barely interact in Chain of Memories. There's no discussion to be had over how much chemistry they may or may not have because not once on screen do we see them so much as speak with one another. Yeah, I 
they know they orchestrated an entire plot to storm the organization capital off screen. But in terms of what we see on screen, Larxene has more fucking chemistry with Demex. And that's only because they despise each other. Or perhaps, maybe they're insulting each other to cover up some hidden tension. Look, if you're into the idea of these two shacking up, then who am I to take that away from you, other than a loner on the internet? But if this is how Canon plans on going about it, then I'll proudly stay away from Marzine, Mala, La Lucia, Lama, <gasps> Lama! Alright, just to clarify this point, because I may have confused it a little, I don't think Canon will actually pursue romance because it never does. But romantic or platonic, my issues remain the same. Larkseen deserves better than to become a puppet just to tag along with Marley. Oh, and one more thing. The YouTube video that showcases this cutscene has the most amazing title you will ever see. I know you're trying to get views, man. But come on. Anyway, homies and homers, now it's time to get to the juicy stuff. We cut to Sora, Lee, and Kairi battling against Psyx. Hey, I thought the moon, or an equivalent to the moon, had to be visible for Psyx to go berserk mode. Whatever, Xemnas appears shortly afterwards, he and Lee share a brief snarkathon, and then this happens. Is this supposed to be a Keyblade? Or is it some sort of joke? Let's take a few steps backwards, shall we? Let's revisit 2012 when it was first revealed to us that Lee is now able to wield a Keyblade. Oh. Unsurprisingly, this was a very polarizing decision. Many welcomed it, citing it as a nice progression to the character's story arc. Others rolled their eyes, tired of how the supposed legendary weapon was being handed out like Huey, Dewey, and Louie medals after every fucking Unchained Key mission. In hindsight, it wasn't worth fussing over, considering how little it mattered in the end. It's borderline comical how Lee spends the entire first 20 hours of the game training in a land where time is infinite and it builds up to bugger all. But as we all know, he's not the character who got the most embarrassing treatment, is he? Now it ends. I will purge that light in you. With darkness! Had, 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 how are you doing that, Xion? His weapon looks bloody hot. How is your hand not catching fire right now? Who are you? It's all right. Xion. Oh. Oh. Useless puppet. Xion. Oh. Oh. Throughout the extremely long wait for this game, a question I often wondered was, how are they going to regain their memories of Xion? Heck, what if they didn't? What if Xion reunited with Roxas and Lee, only for them to have no idea who she is? Wouldn't that be dark? Man, you could write so many interesting ideas with this story element. Well, as it turns out, remembering Best Girl was super easy, barely an inconvenience, as everyone recalls who she is with basically no effort. Xemnas somehow remembers her flawlessly, Sora knows her just fine, Lee remembers in under a minute, isn't that just lovely? You know... I have a lot of thoughts on the decision to bring back every single tragic character in the series, so we can have a sweet little happily ever after ending. It's an extremely complex aspect of the series, and my feelings towards it go beyond being simply positive or negative. But, Roxas, Axel, and Gion have some of the best writing in the series backing them. The character writing in 358 Days Over 2 is the best that Kingdom Hearts has to offer. So when I'm watching cutscenes centered around them that aren't very well written, I'm sorry, it's gonna stick out to me. And let's just be real, when you finished this game for the first time, you had no idea what was going on with Gion. Neither did I. And the DLC elaborating and essentially rewriting this segment is quite clear evidence it wasn't well written. Anyway, Xemnas steps on Lee's foot, which is amazing by the way, and then, 
just when he's about to lay the final blow on Gion. It happens. It's time to deploy the fan service. Hands off my friends. This might be hard to believe, but I'm not a total cynic. So when Roxas burst out of Sora's body, I was confused, but I can't deny I was feeling the hype. Especially with Yoko Shimomura's artistic music accompanying the scene. However, looking back on it now, Roxas gets one noteworthy moment in this game, and every single line is exposition. Most of the organization's members they traveled here from the past as hearts, and you had replicas ready and waiting. I owe my return to many. There was one last thing I needed in order for me to be whole again. I see you're filled with disbelief. You have not laid eyes upon me since we were mere beardless youths competing for the affections of the fair Lady Eleanor. Put aside your Roxas erections for a moment and look at the bigger picture. Personally, I always loved Roxas as a character, because while he was undeniably badass, he was also naive and endearing. We all remember that moment in days where he got a single day off from work and his only thought was ice cream, right? What I'm trying to say is it's cool he got this scene, but yada 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 bad pacing, yada 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 limited character moments, yada 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 I can't be bothered to repeat myself this many times. But hey, if that take was too volcanic for you, that's okay. Because now it's time for the moment where Kingdom Hearts fans worldwide collectively pulled out a knife and stabbed themselves in the eye socket. What difference does one little light make? You have others. Just as we have more darknesses to replenish our ranks. Should I even bother talking about this? What can I add to the conversation that hasn't been endlessly repeated? Do I have anything? Uh, let's see. Um, no, no. <laughs> oh, I know. Time to talk about that scene from earlier. The light in the darkness. It was you. You're the one who kept me from fading away. All I did was believe that you wouldn't. If I were to state that Kyrie was poorly written in Kingdom Hearts 3, that would be about as unpopular as the front page of the Unpopular Opinion subreddit. However, there are of course defenders who insist her writing wasn't actually as bad as most claim. I imagine they say that while bursting into tears every time they see a screenshot of her. Earlier on, when every protagonist was Vord, it was Kyrie's strong, powerful heart that restored them. If it wasn't for her hanging on to her adoration for Sora, that garbage scene would have been the end of them. See guys? She is a strong character. I'm pretty sure most of you know why this is a dumb argument, but I promised I was going to address everything, so here we go. Kyrie didn't save everyone because she's a strong character. She saved everyone because the script said she could do that. It isn't empowering. It isn't relatable. If I could compare Kyrie saving the day by just being strong to another female character, I'd compare her to Mulan. Not quite. Oh no, no. Not that Mulan. The crap one. I'm Juan Mulan. No, you ain't. Yeah, this unfortunate travesty also starred a supposed strong character who was naturally powerful in the most unearned of ways. It's not a perfect comparison, especially because Kairi is definitely not as annoying as live-action Mulan. But my point is, just because a character does a good thing doesn't make them a good character, unless it's earned or developed in some manner. And for the record, I like Kairi. I sympathize with the fans of her who can never seem to get a moment of solace even now. If you want to see Kyrie shine, then I stand with you on that. But I'm never gonna pretend the writing for her in this isn't a whole new world of utter shite. It almost feels deliberate as well. How could Nomura initially establish that Kyrie was going to train in the hyperbolic time chamber so she would eventually get her own piece of ass kicking only for it to turn out like this? Did he know what he was doing? Could it be possible? 
Seriously though, why does Kyrie even have a Keyblade? What does it add to her character or story? The reason why she got access to one in the first place was pencils up nose levels of silly. If she had to wield any kind of weapon, give her something unique so she stands out, instead of another sodding Keyblade. Oh, and also, the way Kyrie behaves in this cutscene is so emotionless, it's borderline creepy. Sora. <laughs> I told you, Sora. You're safe with me. I told you, Sora. You're safe with me. <laughs> You're safe with me. <laughs> Alright, that's enough of my tangent. Back to where we were. So after Xemnas vamooses with Kyrie, Roxas and Gion basically go, Hey, we're not ginger, so we're actually gonna get shit done. And oh boy, they do. Well, less Gion, more Roxas, because God, God damn, bro, give yeah. the man a break! What are you doing to his health, Roxas? Calm down, man! It's like Roxas saw how much his somebody was getting constantly beaten to the ground and felt a burning desire to make up for it in one single fight. Which is pretty awesome. It almost makes up for being unable to play as Roxas. Why aren't we playing as Roxas? Everyone wanted to play as Roxas, yet we aren't playing as Roxas. As it happens, there's a whole host of characters that fans wanted to take control of during the epic climax of this game, but Sora just had to take front and center for every second. During the years of speculation, I remember seeing endless discussions over which characters should fight which villains. Maybe we could see Roxas, Lee, and Gion face off against Xemnas all at once. Or how about Mickey vs. Master Xehanort, or Riku vs. Terranaut? Think of the possibilities. And we almost got close to battles like that. But Sora does not need to be included in the fight against Saiyax. Heck, Sora should be able to knock the bastard out by himself at this point. It's like Nomura suddenly forgot multi-character gameplay was a thing and it had to be all about the main man. Which is interesting, considering he doesn't even like Sora that much. With that said, this fight is pretty fun. Having an army of Soras is rather badass, so you could certainly do a lot worse. I didn't forget you. Yes, I know. I was jealous. Oh, you were jealous. Oh, well, why didn't you say so? All right, fellas, I take back everything I criticized Ice's character arc for. The endless mental torture and attempts at murder? All water under the even taller bridge, boys. This man said he was jealous. Understandable. 10 out of 10 moment. Moving on. I guess I should have brought some ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, I'm not a completely heartless monster, so this scene did get to me. Roxas, Axel, and Gion are best trio fight me, so seeing them together while Lee struggles to keep his legs functioning was a welcome moment I shan't deny. But looking at it now, aware of the story as a whole, Roxas and Gion don't share a single word of dialogue throughout this entire finale. The emotions here are mostly communicated through silence, and that's not a problem at all. But the amount of things I want to see them talk about is endless, and as a result of their dialogue being non-existent, I feel it's fair to say I'm just a little disappointed. It also doesn't help that I have no idea how we even got here in the first place. The story around Gion is so bizarre and unexplained that it's hard to continue keeping both eyebrows contained. If you love this scene and feel the emotional impact, then I get ya. It got me to feel the feels as well. But looking at all of the context and story surrounding it brings the moment down. Though it makes sense they'd have hardly any screen time, considering Nomura only brought them back because the fanbase was loud enough. In case you didn't know. In fact, truth be told, my ranking of the main trio of trios goes like this. Yet I think I prefer the reunion of Terra, Aqua, and Ventus more. Dialogue is shared. The twist of Terra being the Guardian is actually pretty decent. It still feels as rushed as every other bloody character resolution in this game. But I'll praise what I can by this point. 
Although this reunion scene isn't without story issues as well, you might want to pull up a notepad because this part fucks with my head. So after hearing the voice of Ventus, Terra bursts back into life, fucks up Terranaut's day, and returns to normal, right? But let us remember the Terranaut we fight in Kingdom Hearts 3 is a version of Terranaut that time traveled from near the end of birth by sleep. That means the Terra we are reviving is not the Terra that waited in the Keyblade graveyard for a decade. It's a version of Terra that was freed shortly after being possessed in the first place because this Terranaut is a time traveller. I think. To be honest, I'm mostly bullshitting my way through half the series lore here. I wouldn't be shocked if I was wrong. But I'm trying, people. Do you know how difficult it is to thoroughly explain the Kingdom Hearts storyline? Whatever, doesn't matter. I haven't even talked about the cutscene with Darling Vanny Vanny yet. And honestly, the farewell this edgelord gets is kind of amazing. <laughs> then why won't you stand by our side? Instead of with darkness! Because I am darkness. And what you are is darkness? What I am is darkness. Okay. <laughs> It doesn't matter how many cheesy speeches Sora and Ventus offer. It doesn't matter how emotional the background music is. Vanitas is committed to being an absolute drama queen. He's so unapologetically garbage that I can't help but smile at his goodbye. I have never particularly cared about Vanitas as a character, because his personality boils down to I'm an evil person, look at me being very evil and saying mean words and doing mean things. Truly, I'm up there with media's all-time greatest antagonists. However, considering he's one of the only villains to not suddenly go, Oh, but I'm not that bad after all, makes me respect him more. And I find it doubly ironic, considering a ton of fans actually wanted to see this guy get a redemption in some form. No, I don't know why. Oh wait, turns out this moment has translation issues and in the Japanese version, Venita stays a prisoner of darkness so Sora and Ven can live in the light. I'ma pretend I didn't see that. So the grand finale is finally within an arm's reach. Everyone's reunited and only the most important of Xehanorts remain in our way. The most iconic trio of the series, Sora, Riku and Mickey are finally together again. Where's Kairi? Wait, huh? is she in trouble? <sighs> yeah, Xemnas took her. I can't help but wonder what Riku's thinking upon hearing those words. Those four keys will be produced here and now. Yeah, sure. And what makes you think there'd ever be any way we'd help you with that? Oh, I don't know. The fact that all you've done for the past hour is help him? Haven't we learned from Kingdom Hearts 2 that Sora is the master of terrible comebacks? You gonna cry? <laughs> So after a dramatic speech or two, we face off against Xehanort's Heartless, Xemnas and Young Xehanort all in one go. The fight's quite fun, chaotic to a point of madness, but still relatively fair and a good time overall. While I'd prefer individual fights with each character, preferably without an elephant occupying the scenery, having a three-on-three -three battle isn't a bad idea at all. And I like how Xehanort's Heartless no longer has a guardian due to terror being restored. A very nice touch. But wait, how did he transfer the Guardian over to Terranaut in the first- Whatever, doesn't matter, nothing about it. But who cares about the actual battle? Let's go over the farewell cutscenes for each nautical naught. How about we begin with the least infuriating one? <laughs> but Sora, you're done now. Your time in this world is- Okay, so remember everything I said about Vanitas' little goodbye moment? Well, you can copy and paste those exact thoughts here as well. Although it's even better because young Xehanort gets interrupted by his own teleportation. Or as I like to call it, pulling a tenth doctor. I know it's established that young Xehanort loses his memories when he returns to his time period, but I love the idea of him getting pissed off over not finishing his speech. Also, I think it's fair to say Nomura didn't know what to do with this character. He had his purpose of bringing every Xehanort together in Da Da Da, but after that mission was accomplished, he just existed as an arrogant tosser who says a few words and then jolly well trots back where he came from. Alright, that was ironically brilliant. Who's next? <laughs> It's strange. I think I'm gonna miss you. Oh yeah, of course you are, Riku. I mean, the years of being haunted by the ghost of the worst mistake of your life? Over a year of being terrified that at any moment you may be corrupted forever? Wearing the face of that same person? It's only natural you'd miss him, Riku. After all, just think of the memories you made along the way. 
Now I've had the time of my life No, I never felt like this before Yes, I swear it's the truth And I owe it all to you Cause I've had the time of my life And I owe it all to you Jokes aside, can we contrast this scene with the other time Riku said goodbye to Xehanort's Heartless? You know the one. It only happened one game ago. Ansem! You're part of my heart now! Part of the light! You're part of my heart now. God damn, what an ass penetrator of a moment. Even when he's shrouded in darkness within darkness, Riku still manages to come through and make this twat his bitch on a leash. Say what you will about Dodo as a whole, the game was delightful for Riku as a character. Not only is it quite a contrast to the tone he gives here, but this scene reminds us that Xehanort's Heartless might be a contender for the most overly arrogant, desperate bastard of a villain in the series. So seeing him spout shite like, I knew I never stood a chance. No. Sod off, mate. Bye-bye. My first surge of emotion in years, and it's loneliness. Oh, really, Xemnas? This is the first time you've ever felt emotion, is it? You, the person who has smiled and clearly enjoyed himself a number of times? Of course it is. Should have known, really. It must take incredible strength. Come on, people, that is just straight up bollocks. Even if Xemnas had never felt emotion until this point, do we really believe the sociopathic master of manipulation cares about his former cult members? He spent an entire game sitting on a chair while they were brainwashed into doing his bidding. And need I remind you of what he said in DDD? The body will try to replace it. The first chance it gets. I want to frame this fucking sentence on the Empire State Building. My entire reaction to this segment can be summarized via the expression of one Mickey Mouse. So after experiencing one pretty cool boss battle and two character assassinations, Xehanort has 12 of the 13 keys at the ready. It is but one more he requires. And let's be honest, you all know what I'm about to make fun of next. I mean, come on. It's too easy, isn't it? <gasps> Kyrie, You require motivation. Before I continue, I think I should have a bit of maturity for a moment. I've thrown a large amount of shade at Tetsuya Nomura over the course of this video, and I understand that while it's intended to be playful, it may come off in poor taste. So allow me to clarify two important things. First of all, Tetsuya Nomura is not the only writer for the Kingdom Hearts series. Seemingly everyone likes to throw their praise as well as their critiques his way when there are so many more names behind the writing of this saga. I'm not going to go into detail, so I encourage you to do your own research, but my point is, for better or worse, Tetsuya is not the only person who decides how good or bad the writing for Kingdom Hearts is. Second of all, no matter how much I grow frustrated with the last several years of story decisions from this series, the degree at which Tetsuya Nomura has impacted my life cannot be overstated. The only reason I'm writing this almost 20,000 word video essay, fucking hell, is out of sheer passion for this stupid franchise that I love. So I want you to take all of that information and keep it in your mind when I ask this question. How is it possible the same series that produced one of the most beautifully heart-wrenching scenes in gaming can also produce a character death that is this garbage. Why her? Was anyone crying with Sora here? How do you feel any emotion other than sheer bewilderment? If you shed a single tear over this moment, it can only be because you're a Kyrie fan, God bless you. You okay? Also, according to Xehanort, 13 battles with the Guardians of Light were necessary to forge the Keyblade, and apparently this qualifies as a battle. If all you had to do was backstab a Guardian, then why even bother setting up numerous battlefields? You should have just popped down to your nearest Moogle shop, purchased a Desert Eagle, and gone to town on everyone else. 
Although now that I think about it, I guess that explains why he sent the tornado to kill everyone. Because that apparently counts as a clash between 7 and 13. Fuck, this writing is brainless. And one more thing. Why does Riku take so bloody long to react to his childhood bestie being slaughtered? Say Nord! The only thing more depressing than Kairi's writing is the writing for her relationship with Riku these days. So after Kairi gets Kairied, Xehanort finally has all 13 keys at his disposal. Raising his weapon, he forges the Keyblade and shrouds Kingdom Hearts in darkness, causing a dark blue meteor shower of sorts. Sora's about to give up once again, but his worries are quenched when Donald, Goofy, and the rest of our rescued heroes return to him. Sorry we took so long. Had a couple of plot points that needed ironing out. Hmm? The, 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 that's it? Just a glance? You see someone with the same body as you, and you just a hmm, and then that's it? All good? Oh, no, okay, all right then. The gang seems unsure of what to do, but it's okay because we have Mickey Mouse and the most badass front flips ever known. <laughs> Mr. Mouse has a plan to trap Xehanort, and even after rewatching this cutscene multiple times, I'm still not sure what that plan is. Something about Xehanort being a portal which they can use against him? Look, it doesn't matter. Point is, big Keyblade laser beams whack him in the face. <laughs> Oh, Mickey asks Riku and Aqua to assist him in knocking out the old tosser, but Sora steps in because over the past few hours he's grown rather fond of being a glory whore. One flash of light later and we find ourselves in the undeniably more interesting final world, Scala Ad Kylum. Now this, this is a final world. Colourful but mysterious, intricate and detailed, intriguingly mystifying music. I can't wait to be able to explore it. Look, you already know how shafted this area was. There ain't no point in me making this joke, nor is there any point in discussing what has already been discussed to a universally agreed extent. Anyway, one cutscene later, in which Sora continues to harbour the worst reaction speed known to mankind, and we begin the final boss rush of the Xehanort Saga. And these bosses are some of the worst battles I've ever been subjected to. Nah, I'm just kidding, they're all pretty good. The first one has Xehanort splitting into several individual entities, all disguised as goats and all sharing a health bar. It's pretty unique and engaging, with a sexy little easter egg here and there. The following battle divides itself into multiple segments, and while it's a little gimmicky, it's still enjoyable, and the battlefield is consistently interesting visually. There is one sky. One destiny! <gasps> he said the thing! He said the thing! And the final battle is probably the best boss fight in the base game. Xehanort has consistent patterns, attacking him feels satisfying, you get to make use of guarding in midair. It's also the only boss in the game to contain a genuinely, creatively epic moment that caught me off guard. Would I say it's as good as the most amazing, satisfying, legendarily incredible final boss ever crafted by humanity? No, but that's okay, because that's one hell of a bar to grab hold of. Now with all that said, this did not feel like a final boss. A staple of the numbered Kingdom Hearts titles is at least one ginormous airship comprised of several different pieces, all of which you have to destroy in an effort to bring the antagonist down. Honestly, this battle right here might be even better than Final Xemnas. The chills it gives me can't be understated. As much as I do like this battle, I was extremely surprised to learn upon my initial playthrough that this was it. Heck, Xehanort doesn't even change outfits. He doesn't wear the skin of Marty from Madagascar. He couldn't even be bothered to take his shirt off. What a disappointment. I want my money back, Square. Oh, and one more thing. Why is defeating Master Xehanort even a struggle? Terra managed to beat him with relative ease in Birth by Sleep, and I highly doubt he's stronger than Sora, Dolan, and Gooby combined. Yeah, I know he has the Keyblade, but so did Venetus, and Ventus still defeated him despite being an inexperienced child. Whatever, I'm nitpicking now. Let's just get to the end already. Sora, finish the job. <laughs> The dust clears, and Sora stands before a severely wounded Xehanort. We're finally here, ladies and gentlemen. 
the final cutscene with the antagonist of the entire series up to this point. Once this segment comes to a close, the Dark Seeker saga will as well. And what better way to finish this story than by giving Xehanort the most polarizing ending ever? The light of Kingdom Hearts. It can give us a new start. No. An empty world, pure and bright. Stop. The world needs someone to stand up and lead to stop the weak from polluting the world with their endless darkness. Desist! In a dazzling set of lights, the rest of the Kingdom Hearts fam squad descends in front of Sora. And I think by this point, Nomura has just given up trying to explain how things happen. Also, if there is one character the PS4 graphics have been especially flattering to, it would undoubtedly be Terra. Like, he was a dashing enough lad to begin with, but this game said he needs to go full handsome Squidward and never look back. After a brief stare down, Ericus materializes from inside Terra's body. Approaching Master Xehanort, he goes, Hey, stop being a big meanie. And Xehanort's like, Okay, I'll stop being a big meanie. Ericus shares a heartfelt goodbye with his students, although I think it would have been significantly more meaningful if Terra referred to him as father. You know, what with birth by sleep implying such a connection. Anyway, Xehanort joins Ericus in a bro hug, and together, they ascend into what I assume is Kingdom Hearts Heaven, where they can reflect on the many memories they made. Now I've heard... Alright, we have a lot to unpack here, don't we now? When it comes to this particular story decision, I've bared witness to a great deal of shouting matches from both sides. And for that reason, I'm going to be careful and crystal clear about the points I make. Okay, here we go. Master Xehanort did not get redeemed. Kind of. Everyone seems to relentlessly use the word redemption, but it isn't accurate here. The man states that he wants to restart a universe filled with light once more. However, he then clarifies that he intends to take full control of it. Nomura was clearly writing him as a dictator in this scene. Now, the revelation is still remarkably moronic and blatantly retconning his motivation for birth by sleep, but referring to his characterization as a redemption simply isn't correct. Especially as this line right here is a translation error. In the Japanese text, Xehanort reveals he wants to restart the universe as a blank canvas, not a pure and bright one. However, putting that aside, I don't care about whether or not Xehanort got redeemed. That isn't where the issue lies. The issue is how fucking easily Xehanort went down. Once again, let's take a step back to both Dada Dur and Baba Sur for a moment. These games spend cutscene after cutscene hyping up how much of a mastermind Xehanort is. He can calculate events happening over a decade ahead of time. He can assemble multiple diabolical pathways in case one plan falls apart. Basically, he's the super villain version of that one meme with the guy and the photos on the wall, you know the one. So how is it that a man so apparently intelligent and cunning wound up getting defeated like any other run-of-the-mill bad guy. It took barely any effort to wipe this guy out. Sora wasn't any smarter than usual. He just whacked him with his keyblade as always and the wazit gave up. Even his dialogue becomes generic in the end. Why? How? You are too late. It is too late. No. I can do this. I half expected him to go, and I would have gotten away with it if it weren't for you meddling kids and that dog. And while he wasn't redeemed, I have to wonder why his personality was so softened here, and his ending so kind. I'm aware no one gets a bad ending anymore because Kingdom Hearts must be the friendship series, but if the other versions of the character can get wiped out of existence, the genocidal maniac that is the original certainly can. Very well done. Do you remember how vicious Sora could be in Kingdom Hearts 2? If only that Sora made a comeback this time around. My heart is remembering how to feel. Really? That's good. Excuse me? But I can't be too mad. Because now that Xehanort is finally deceased, that brings his story to a close. Ladies and gentlemen, the story is over. The Dark Seeker saga is over, and Xehanort is gone for good. Never to make another appearance. Not so fast, my dear. Aha, so that's why Xehanort was nicer in the flashback. 
Namora changed his mind again. After sealing Kingdom Hearts away forever, the gang returns to the Keyblade Graveyard. There's no time to celebrate because Sora reminds the audience that Kairi is dead. Thank you, Sora. I genuinely forgot. Sora plans on saving her, but Mickey begs him not to be too hasty. And he does so while sporting a beaming smile for the entire bloody cutscene. Summoning his Keyblade, Sora fires a light in the keyhole of the world, and finally, we hear the familiar sound of the simple and clean instrumental. Many a happy reunion is shared, as well as the unfortunate reminder the mobile gacha game exists. And as we see Roxas, Lee, and Gion meet up on the Twilight Town clock tower for old time's sake. Hey, does anyone else remember when Sykes said to Roxas, I will leave you with nothing? No, just me? Okay. But best of all, if you're a Namine fan who felt this walking angel got just a little bit shafted, don't worry, because she's finally given a whole one scene of being on screen. She gets brought back in a brand new body, wakes up to the faces of those who let her get captured, makes her way into Radiant Garden, and in a true twist of events, the most romantic scene in Kingdom Hearts 3, complete with flower petals and all, didn't belong to Sora and Kairi. Now that was unexpected. Wow, would you look at that. The Kingdom Hearts family, all together on Destiny Islands. Now, doesn't this ending feel familiar? And yet, why does it feel so hollow this time around? All right, pause for a second. Am I comparing this finale to Kingdom Hearts 2's too much? Believe it or not, I'm trying to avoid doing so. Look, Kingdom Hearts 2 is my favorite video game ever. I can't pretend I'm not a very biased bugger. And hey, it's not like Kingdom Hearts 2's ending was perfect either, but... But... Actually, you know what? Fuck that. Kingdom Hearts 2's ending was perfect. We'll go together. Yeah. Yeah, of course it didn't always make the most sense. The door to light appearing out of nowhere to save Sora and Riku just because Sora read Kairi's letter and got sad has barely a thread of logic to it. The all-powerful, all-vague machine of Ansem's conveniently managing to restore Riku back to his original form is a little shoddy. I could nitpick and critique Kingdom Hearts 2's ending all day long, but I won't, because in terms of giving the intended emotional feeling to the player, Kingdom Hearts 2 delivered more than I ever could have asked for. The build-up was perfect. Perfect. The character resolutions made sense, and the battles are the highlights of the entire franchise to this day. I don't care that certain aspects of it were illogical, and guess what? My problem with Kingdom Hearts 3's story isn't that it's illogical either. Especially considering some of the most beloved stories of all time are completely devoid of any logic whatsoever. But here's the thing. There is a fine line between frustratingly illogical and whimsically illogical. Most of the Kingdom Hearts series falls on the latter half of the grid, while Kingdom Hearts 3 sadly falls into the former. I understand why you might be upset by how often people compare these two games, rather than viewing them individually. But the reality is, you can't play through this game without making comparisons, no matter how much you may want to consciously avoid it. <sighs> Anyway, I love that the entire Kingdom Hearts family was invited to Destiny Islands, even Haina, Pence, and Olette. But meanwhile, Tida, Selfie, and Wacker were given a thorough middle finger. Because Nomura said, fuck Final Fantasy, who even gives a shit about that series? We're a strong independent franchise that don't need no weeb trash. But the party can't last long. Because as everyone looks towards the Paupu tree where Sora and Kairi rest, a single tear rolls down Kairi's cheek and Sora fades away. When I finished this game, I didn't even realize he was gone. Yeah, really. I remember going on the internet to find out how the Kingdom Hearts fanbase felt about the game, and found myself extremely confused as to what everyone was talking about when they said that Sora was dead. Certainly not how I expected this legendary game to finish. But in hindsight, I can't say I'm too shocked. After all, looking back on everything I've criticized, 
it's clear that Kingdom Hearts 3 would rather tease a story than tell one. And that's it. End of the line. I don't have anything to say about the secret ending, either of them, so there we go. You and I made it to the end. It's difficult to describe how I felt when I finished this game for the first time. Frankly, I was so baffled by everything I saw that I didn't know what to think. I knew I was disappointed, but I couldn't decipher my thoughts and fully conclude how I felt. But now, three years later, at the time of writing, I can sadly but confidently tell you that I truly hate this conclusion. The pacing of Kingdom Hearts games has never been flawless, but Kingdom Hearts 3 takes it to an all-time low. Every moment that fans have anticipated was compromised and suffocated by condensing the story into one singular act. The story does the absolute bare minimum and expects you to get emotional. The only subversion of expectations comes from the horrible characterizations that blatantly come out of nowhere alongside the embarrassing attempts at creating tension. If you genuinely love this game's finale, then more power to you. But wouldn't you have loved it even more if time was actually given to the characters you and I both love? And wouldn't you have loved it more if the writing never made you scratch your head with utter befuddlement? Maybe it didn't for you. And in which case, I don't think I can ever comprehend that. I've seen brilliant writing from this series before. I know what it looks like when these characters that I adore are well written. I'm not a professional writer, by any means, but I can imagine what a truly great Kingdom Hearts 3 finale would look like, and this was not it. So this is a brand new Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer that dropped this morning. Uh, I, I, I believe was premiered initially at the recent uh, Kingdom Hearts World Orchestra. And uh, essentially, it's, it's what Nomura and Square have been talking about for the last couple of months. On the 11th of June, 2019, the first trailer for Kingdom Hearts 3 Remind released. It showed potential, but little was shown. On the 9th of September 2019, the second trailer for Kingdom Hearts 3 Remind released. It showed further potential. People were getting excited. On the 10th of December 2019, the final trailer for Kingdom Hearts 3 Remind released. And fans went ecstatic. No way! No, I can't no, I I'm about to cry! Final Fantasy characters, data battles, playable Kyrie, playable everyone, extra story cutscenes, the promise of a better finale. Even I, someone who was left disappointed by the original game, fell into the hype. This was what I was expecting to see from the beginning. This looked like how I envisioned Kingdom Hearts 3 in my head. Of course I realized it wouldn't fix most of my glaring issues with the overall story, but I was hopeful that I could at the very least come out of it with more optimism than before. So when January the 23rd of 2020 came around, I loaded the disc in and replayed the entire game, and with a heap of anxiety, began the DLC. The content in Kingdom Hearts 3 Remind is brilliant. The secret bosses are consistently amazing from start to finish. The story around Bootleg Noctis is actually pretty interesting. Exploring Scala Ad Kylum was delightful. But I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about two particular segments that happen back to back. Two incredible segments. The minigame in which you take control of everyone is pure magic. It's unique and engaging, the cinematics behind it are mesmerizing, and we actually get some much desired character interactions! You, the power to protect, you, you can't hear any of them, but I'm glad to see them nonetheless. I wasn't sure how this would work, but I can honestly say I was more than happy with how it turned out. But even that can't compare to the last stand of Mickey fucking Mouse. No, I, I can't give up. I have to get closer. I had no idea what was going on, and I don't think I ever will. This is the most nonsensical, phenomenally absurd moment in the entire Kingdom Hearts series, and I adored it. The hype that I wanted to feel was finally being given to me. How can you not enjoy Mickey slicing his way through the opposition on his last breath? Mickey Mouse, the most badass character in fiction, everybody.
It wasn't perfect, and it was even a little insane, but the additions that Remind presented me with were genuinely pleasing to go through. It's a shame that to get to it, you have to re-watch every single fucking painful cutscene from the base game finale a second time over, as well as replay the exact same battles again! Oh, for sure, the character you control is different, but if everything around that character is the same, then I don't give a dropping of power wild you're in. Also, how many times are you gonna make me watch this cutscene, Namora? Do you know? Are you bitter that this cutscene is made fun of so thoroughly? So you're just trying to spite people? What was even gained from making this extra story content a menu option? Why couldn't it have done the same thing that Kingdom Hearts 1 Final Mix, Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix, and Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep Final Mix did, and just integrate the content into the actual main story? How can anyone think forcing the player to replay multiple segments once again with minor alterations is a wise idea? Is it because you didn't know how to tie this story piece to the original finale? Well, if you didn't know, I can certainly say this was not how it should have been done. So yeah, my complaints about Base Kingdom Hearts 3 haven't changed. Remind was a band-aid. A very enjoyable band-aid, but you can still see all the blood and bruises that lie beneath it. When I saw the trailer and the Final Fantasy crew showed their faces, I immediately thought to myself, hey, that's gonna be their only cutscene, isn't it? And I was more or less correct. Don't get excited for Square Enix trailers, people because the marketing team never knows when to stop. And with that, I have said everything I wanted to say about Kingdom Hearts 3 story. Before I take my exit, there are two questions I want to answer. Initially, I was going to talk about how dormant the Kingdom Hearts fanbase currently is, and how there isn't much to get excited over, and how there was a new Kingdom Hearts game, but it didn't make much of a splash in the fandom. But due to many personal issues, this video has taken a while to release, and... But I still want to talk about this anyway. From 2020 to 2022, the Kingdom Hearts fanbase was in a weird spot. In some ways, the community became more quiet than it had been in over a decade. The details of what would happen next in the series were vague, and there wasn't a lot to be excited over. And yet, even after the next numbered title was announced, it still feels like the fanbase is quieter than it was last time, but still especially fractured. Granted, it's always been divided to some degree. You can find adoring fans of every game in the series, just as you can find plenty of critical players who aren't happy with the direction the series has gone. And it feels like with Kingdom Hearts 3, both sides exist in equal measures more than ever before. I think going forward, a very large portion of fans are going to be cautious with their excitement for any new installment. Never forget that Kingdom Hearts 3 was one of the most hyped up video games of the decade. And while for many it delivered, for a lot of us, myself included, something changed. The excitement that we harboured over this long running story couldn't be fully retained. Especially as the next portion of the Kingdom Hearts storyline is centred around a fucking mobile gacha game. Or games. Every time a new game in this series releases, you're gonna buy it day one and so will I. But there's been a growing argument that the series should have ended 17 years ago, and while I'm not prepared to agree with that, I've definitely accepted that my favourite era of this series will never be recaptured. Every Kingdom Hearts fan has at least one frustration with the story, and I hope Nomura understands that. In fact, I'd like to draw your attention to this interview paragraph. Here, Namora clarifies how when writing the final act, it was difficult to decide where to place the focus and how to pace the events. It feels evident in this text that he was severely struggling under the weight of all the build-up he'd let get out of control. I hope he's learned a lesson since. Because how many times can Kairi be thrown to the side before the community finally snaps? And with that said, I bring myself to the other question I want to answer. As I said before, there are aspects of the story that I'm still interested in. Yazora is the most fan fiction inclusion in the franchise so far, and yet, there is something at least a little captivating about his story. But I can't pretend I'm as excited to see where the series goes as I want to be. 
I can't pretend I'm invested in what the characters do because the Kingdom Hearts cast is too absurdly clogged for it to matter. Unless different characters garner a bit of centre stage for a change, I can't act like I'm enthusiastic for where their stories take them. Especially since I despise what has happened to half of the characters to begin with. To say I'm a Kingdom Hearts fan is underselling it. There hasn't been a day of my life in the last decade where I haven't thought about this series. Sometimes for a minute, sometimes for hours. I'm always going to care about the story of this franchise to some degree, but when it comes to maintaining my investment in the story as it continues, I'm significantly more concerned than I ever want to be. I'll end this video on one final note. There is going to be at least one commenter on this video who reprimands me for having high expectations. It's an easy and frequent argument to make that fans were just too excited for the game to release and set their standards too high as a result. First of all, I'm not the kind of person who gets excited for pieces of media. My expectations didn't go far beyond halfway decent pacing and writing decisions that made sense. And second of all... I'm sorry, did you not have expectations for a video game titled Kingdom Hearts 3? I was I was in middle school when this game came out Kingdom Hearts 1 for the PS2 Is it too alien to not have a complete experience for something you waited so long for?